itself a sub years of science. How does he feel? He certainly does feel salt. The mind somehow record of its own experience of things seen, heard, and felt. The experience of the senses is organized and translated of adults. Some children's early experience is so disorganized, they may need help in identifying themselves. Oh, who is that? Tell me who it is. David. Is that David? I think it is David. That is Carson. Are you handsome today? No. You're not? No. I think you are. I think Carson's very handsome today. Do you know what kind of meat you have today? I'll tell you what it is. It's turkey. Turkey. Let me hear everybody say it. Turkey. There are children whose experience is limited, who grow up deprived of words. What are they? Why? What are they? What? You worry, what is that in your tray? Say it nice and loud. Potatoes. Say potatoes. Potatoes. There are children who grow up hearing few nouns, the names for things, and some who have heard very few adjectives, the words we use to describe the impressions the world makes on our senses, hot or cold, hard or soft, rough or gentle. Tell me. You certainly do have a closed pen. How does it feel? Soft. Is it soft? Feel it again. Is it soft? I think it feels hard. Feel it again. Isn't it hard? What do you have? An envelope. A what? An envelope. Is it the board or is it the iron? Uh -uh. Yes, it is. Do you know what it's made out of? Yeah. What? Um. It's an iron, but do you know what it's made out of? Look at it. Um. Does anyone know what this is made out of? Uh -huh. This is made of wood. What is it made of? Oh, wood. Wood. How does the mind absorb experience? How do the impressions of the senses get translated into thoughts and feelings? Science now suggests this answer. It happens through the chemical action of cells in the brain. Thinking, learning, feeling, remembering are all physical chemical events which we are now beginning to understand, which we're now beginning to be able to observe and to measure, and which someday, not in the too distant future perhaps, we can initiate, modify, and control. What we've learned in the past decades... We are observers at one of the outposts of mental research. This is Charles Kuralt reporting from the University of Chicago. The speaker is Dr. Sebastian Peter Grossman. His subject, neurochemistry, the chemistry of the brain. Everything is chemical, but the environment has a very strong influence on the chemical reactions that take place in the brain. Well, if thinking is a physical process, does that mean that there is a physical difference between a smart brain and a dumb one? Does a, does a bright child's brain look any different from a slow child's brain? Animal research has actually shown physical differences in the size of brains of animals that have been reared in isolation versus animals that have been reared in an environment that is very complex. You mean a rat who's had a lot of experience in life has a heavier brain than a rat who hasn't? Yes, that's true. But, of course, this is something that's very difficult to test in man. You can't, at this time, take the brain of a bright child and that of a dumb one, put them side by side, and expect to see a physical difference between them. And yet there must be one. Yet there must be a difference in either the chemical composition of that brain or in the speed of chemical reactions or in the nature of the chemical reactions which take place in those two brains. Can the mind be changed physically? Can that chemical difference between dumb and smart be reduced? Science has begun to probe for answers in the mind itself. 
in the three pound mass of tissue, the 10 billion cells that make up the brain. These are brain cells filmed through a microscope in their normal chemical surroundings of acids, hormones, enzymes. When a new chemical is injected, something visible happens. The brain cells contract. What researchers like Grossman have been discovering is which groups of these cells are involved in which mental states, anxiety, hunger, rage, and which chemicals affect them. This is how those states of mind are mapped and changed by inserting drugs through tubes planted in the brains of animals, planted precisely enough to pinpoint a single cell. The operation is painless. The brain has no nerves of its own. In this way, certain feelings can be aroused artificially, chemically. The peaceful cat has been turned aggressive, not by any real threat, but by an injection of drugs in a specific part of the brain. Even basic instincts can be reversed. This rat has been allowed to eat its fill. It isn't hungry. The same rat can be made to feel an artificial hunger. The brain cells involved in appetite can be stimulated with a chemical, and full or not, the rat will keep on eating. In other experiments, male rats have been made to act maternal, building nests and tending babies when injected with brain chemicals, an artificial feeling of motherhood produced in the mind of a male animal. What science has learned in the animal labs is being confirmed in the hospitals. This is the human mind observed and measured. The chemical processes of the brain generate electrical energy, current streaming along the circuits formed by cells. It registers about 20 watts, enough power for a small light bulb. This is a normal brain, the pattern quite even and regular. This is the brain of a schizophrenic. You are looking at mental illness. In the eyes of science, this too must be chemical, possibly a hormone deficiency or a fault of metabolism, something caused by stress or a defect some people may be born with. It has already turned out that way in the case of some mental disorders. Like the case of Steve Bergeron, Steve is an eight-year-old sports buff, a Beatles fan, and an average student. Average and therefore remarkable, because if not for certain small miracles of chemistry, he would not be able to talk, feed himself, or tie his own shoes. He would not be able to walk, play ball, or ride a bike. Steve is a formerly retarded child. What has saved Steve is a special diet which his mother prepares according to medical prescription. No milk, no meat, but a powdered chemical compound. It substitutes for foods containing proteins, which are vital to the brain, but which can't be absorbed by children born with an enzyme deficiency called phenylketonuria, PKU. It used to be regarded as hopeless or treated as an emotional problem. Either way, it ended with the patient lapsing into idiocy. Now, on this diet of artificial protein, Steve's IQ has been steadily raised from hopelessly retarded to normal. You can make it so many things under it. A bee, a head full of flies. We looked at um, some letters and they looked gigantic. A mind salvaged through chemistry. The conquest of PKU is a historic triumph over mental illness. It has spurred the search for other chemical causes, other antidotes. These chemicals are clues in the search. The mind drugs, known in the laboratory as amphetamines and phenothiazines, known to millions who use them by trade names like dexedrine and thorazine, 
discovered only in the 1950s, they have already become commonplace, the aspirin of this age of anxiety. But they are potent beyond their use as tranquilizers or pick-me-ups, and their direct impact on specific mental functions makes them unique in the history of medicine. They have not solved mental illness, but they have already revolutionized the treatment separated from life by their own disordered thoughts, their troubled moods, their compulsive actions. This is mental illness as it has always been, as it is today for many patients. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Some patients have lived this way for as long as 20 years, but now thousands are being rescued from this kind of existence. These women, too, are patients in a state mental hospital, figures in a brightening image. The very atmosphere of mental illness is changing. No padded cells, no wild histrionics. A doctor told us, I wouldn't know where to find a straitjacket in this place if we ever needed one. This place is Spring Grove near Baltimore, Maryland. Here is what has made the difference. The psychoactive drugs, the so-called mind drugs, tranquilizers for the anxious mind, energizers for the depressed. They are the difference between the snake pit and the sanctuary. Patients who once might have been locked up for years or for lifetime can now look forward to getting back to life, sometimes in a matter of weeks. These are the drugs that opened up the study of the mind as a complex of chemical processes, as an organ to be treated by chemistry. Do you know what kind of place this is? Yes, it's a mental hospital mm -hmm. for mentally disturbed people, such as myself. Are you mentally disturbed? Yes, I'm depressed. I don't have peace of mind. Uh -huh. I tried to commit suicide in April. To see just what sort of change drugs can produce in the disordered mind, we got permission to film two patients over the period of their first week at Spring Grove. This patient is Virginia, interviewed by a psychologist, Dr. Thomas Hanlon. I knew I had had a lot of troubles. Mm -hmm. And they said, and this forced thing, like I said, the only way that you can solve your problem is to go back to church. And I said, to church? Are you kidding? This is the whisper of this to myself, you know. Mm -hmm. They said, yes. What do you think this voice was? Jesus. Do you really think so? Yes. This is what I believe. You cannot take away my belief. Have you heard Jesus at any other time? Yes, numerous when? times. And he's talked to you just as I'm talking to you? Just as you're talking to me. When was the last time you heard Jesus speak to you? This morning. This morning? Yes. Uh-huh. Now, do you hear Jesus right now? Yes, he's telling me what to say to you. He, he tells you what, how to speak, what to say, how to say it. Uh -huh. He puts words in your mouth. He puts shoes on your feet. You can hear his voice? Yes. It's faint, but I can hear it. That's why I whisper a lot of times. That's why I talk softly. Mm -hmm. Because so he can... talks, comes to me softly, see? So and no one else knows when he comes to me. Mm -hmm. No one but me. Yeah. Well, why would Jesus single you out? Because I'm a chosen child. He told me this this morning. He said, you're a chosen child. You must work in the hospital and the jail. And now you're here, right? I'm you're, here. You, you I can up. do all kinds of work here. Good work. Only good work can I do here because this is my place. Yeah, but how about yourself? 
I'm going to help myself. See, they're going to give me treatment here. They are? Pills. They've given me, started giving me pills since yesterday. Uh-huh. Oh, they, they did, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you need uh, treatment? Certainly. Oh, doctor. Yeah. Please help me. You want your medication then? This is Anne, the second of the two patients we observed. Here, she has just been admitted to the hospital after a severe breakdown, affecting her muscular control as well as her state of mind. A generation ago, Anne might have remained beyond the doctor's reach, unable to organize her thoughts or master her troubled feelings. Now, if the medication works, she may become reasonable enough for psychotherapy, confronting and understanding her own problems with the guidance of a psychiatrist, Dr. Charles Savage, director of research at Spring Grove. I'm all, you know, put together. I'm just like a pretzel. Yes. I feel like a pretzel. All twisted up. Yeah. Yeah. Life is so painful. Yeah. Oh, doctor. Doctor. Yeah. Help me. In mental hospitals, time used to be measured in months or years. But the mind drugs have given time a new dimension. Here is Anne after a single week of treatment. I'm ready to leave. You look great. <laughs> you're feeling as, you're feeling as good as you look? Yes. In what way, Anne? Well, I'm not psychotic. <laughs> well, that's a help. <laughs> Can you explain that a little? <laughs> well, um face in reality, I mean, instead of trying to yeah. escape from like I was before, I think I, I, I knew I was getting psychotic. Uh -huh. How'd you know when you were getting psychotic? How did I know it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because my, if I put my arm up, I couldn't get it down. Oh, yeah. And my muscles, I couldn't uh, control them. Yeah. I couldn't get my uh, head from coming, uh, bring my head oh, yeah. forth. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think has helped you to get over this psychosis? Well, I think um, the help of the hospital and uh, being protected. When I knew that I couldn't take care of myself, I knew someone was going to help me. Yeah. And, uh, medication. Uh -huh. Anne did leave the hospital a few weeks later and started a new job in a nursing home. But for every triumph like this, there are also setbacks. For Virginia, the drugs produced no such dramatic change. Remember, Jesus was helping you out. Then, oh, yes, he? he was. He's still helping me out. Right now, when I talk to you, he tells me what to say, exactly what to say and when to stop and everything. He's the one who's guiding me. What does he want you to do, Virginia? He wants me to go to college one day. He wants me one day to write a book, to speak some French, to work in a hospital, not for pay in a hospital, but just to preach his holy word. He wants me to work in a hospital and in a jailhouse. I think I mentioned this to you before. <coughs> mm -hmm. You're getting then, medication? Oh, yes, I'm getting all types of medication. Oh, uh, what kind? Liquid and shots. Uh -huh. What's the medication for? Do you have any idea? To calm me down when I get loud. I get loud sometimes and very out of hand. Talk loud and ugly. I don't really curse. I swear a lot. Uh -huh. When did you do that last? Mm, when I did. When was I? I was in seclusion. <laughs> I've been in seclusion ever since I've been here. Why did you laugh when you said you were in seclusion? Because they didn't understand that I enjoyed being in seclusion, too. That didn't hurt me. You enjoyed it? Oh, yes. I begin to, I could, I could even holler out more louder in seclusion because that's, for, that's when they think you're really going nuts. Uh -huh. Really off your rocker. And I'm, I know that I'm not off my rocker, see. Uh -huh. So I was happy to be in seclusion. You so say you're not off your rocker. Oh, no. Uh -huh. I couldn't possibly be off my rocker. I got too much Jesus in me. Uh -huh. Even with a week of medication, Virginia remained beyond reach of treatment. When she left the hospital, it was only to return. For the drugs themselves are not enough. In this changing atmosphere of mental illness, just what do the mind drugs accomplish and what are their limitations? We consulted the director of research for the Maryland Department of Mental Hygiene, Dr. Albert A. Kurland. Drug therapy is one form of therapy. 
uh, it helps to make many patients available for treatment that one couldn't ordinarily get to. It's like the surgeon operating in a surgical field before he can go in and do the correct, uh, carry out the corrective measures that are necessary. He has to tie off the bleeders. He has to stop uh, hemorrhage. He has to get the pa uh, patient into some state that is stabilized so that the necessary uh, uh, treatment efforts uh, can be undertaken. And these are where the drugs play such an important part. Uh, it makes other treatments available. And uh, of course, uh, even with the drugs and with the other treatments, such as psychotherapy, these can only accomplish so much, too, in many of our patients. The hell called mental illness is no less deep than it used to be. There are still private snake pits, the inner agonies of patients whose troubles can't be calmed. But the odds have brightened. For the patient, the chances of going home. For the doctors, the chance that they will discover the chemistry of schizophrenia, as they have for PKU. And so, perhaps, they will find a cure. Science, meanwhile, has been encouraged to look beyond the problem of mental illness, to the improvement of the normal mind. Drugs as an aid to memory and learning. Ready? On. No, no, no. Memory, an experience recorded by chemical action in the cells of the brain and retained there. In some forms of brain surgery, memories may be located and deliberately released, as in this operation. Buddy, did you feel anything? I didn't feel anything, but I heard something. What, what did you hear? It sounded uh, like... Was it any particular piece that you uh, could recognize? No, but it's something like I've heard before. There is no music in the operating room. What the patient heard was his own memory, a tune recorded in his brain at some time in the past. The patient experiences it all over again when certain cells of the brain are probed with instruments which stimulate the chemical flow of memory. Not of anything. Ready? On. Neil. Neil. The chemistry of the intellect, of learning, remembering, thinking. Some questions for Dr. Sebastian Peter Grossman of the University of Chicago. Is uh, everything that you've ever experienced uh, recorded in the brain somehow and permanently stored there? Well, we now think that there are two kinds of memories. That there is a short-term memory which is based on very transient, short-lived electrochemical events and that is probably best exemplified by the man who looks up a telephone number, dials it, and immediately forgets it. That's lost to him. That is lost completely. Then there is a long-term memory, which is based on perhaps irreversible chemical changes in the brain, so that those memories would, at least in theory, be with you for the rest of your life. Well, if that's the case, uh if those memories are all there, inside your skull, uh, is there a way to get them out, to recall them with pills or drugs or some other kind of stimulus? It is beginning to seem possible that we could facilitate the recall of memory. The memories that you seem to have forgotten are not available to you, not because uh, the memory is impaired normally, but because something is blocking their recall, something is keeping you from remembering. And we think that much of this has nothing to do with memory, but is an emotional problem. You cannot remember an event from your childhood because uh, you fear the memory. And obviously here, it becomes easy to interfere with the, with the anxiety component of the problem and to bring back memories to you that seemed lost. That seems to imply that uh, someday I might be able to take a pill to uh, summon up the Latin one I learned in high school. Uh, I think it is unlikely that you will find a pill that will bring back Latin one. 
it is quite likely that you may be able to buy a pill which will facilitate recall in general and perhaps even facilitate recall of some period of your life like the time that you did take Latin one, but not specifically one thing from that period. There is no chemical substitute for memory, but there may be some chemical aid. Here at the Mental Health Research Institute of the University of Michigan, a search is being conducted, a quest in many directions by many branches of science. A large force of research has zeroed in on a specific particle within each brain cell, an acid molecule called RNA. These molecules, changing chemically with every new experience of the senses, may be the key to memory, the means by which learning is taken in and stored. Some of the experiments are conducted with student volunteers as subjects. This fascinating business of memory, so crucial in everyday life, and so unpredictable. We talked about it with a group of the students. My name is Clarice Rubin. I am a fourth year in the study of anthropology. My name is Bob Feidelman. I'm a senior in naval architecture. My name is Brenda Drum, and I'm a senior in the field of education. I'm Bob Hildreth, and I'm in pre-medical studies. I'm a senior. I'm Charlie Sutherland. I'm an English major, a senior. Uh, Charles, do you remember what uh, field Brenda said she was in? Pre-med. <laughs> Is that right? No, it isn't. Bob Hildreth, do you remember what uh, Clarice, Clarice Rubin said she was uh, studying? Um, I don't believe she was studying. She named a field that she was in. No, I don't remember it. Anthropology. That's right. <laughs> well, how is it that you can, that you can uh, sit here and listen to, uh, to these things, uh, paying attention as you all were, and, uh, and yet not remember something that happened just 10 seconds before. I think most of us were concentrating on what we were going to say when our turn came up rather than listening <laughs> to the other person. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's probably true. Well, you know, it's a cliche that, that memory uh, plays tricks on you. Well, really, when it comes down to it, how do you remember something? It would seem as though the memory needed a trigger in order to start off on a sequence of events. Mm -hmm. I think this is true. I can remember in elementary school that our teacher taught us how to spell arithmetic by using a rat in the house may eat the ice cream. And I never have forgotten that. <laughs> a rat in the house may eat the ice cream. And I've never forgotten that. And to this day, when I write down arithmetic, I think of it. There are a lot of things like that. The colors of the spectrum, too. Mm -hmm. I had a science teacher told us the name Roy G. Biv. Mm -hmm. Red, orange, yellow, uh, <laughs> green, blue, <laughs> indigo, and violet. Uh, last year I had a course where we were required to memorize 50 lines of John Milton. And uh, this was very difficult because it wasn't extremely interesting and it was in a different uh, kind of English than we were used to. And in order to memorize it, I memorized the first line, then I went to the second line, and I thought of the last word in the first line, which triggered my memory of the next line. And I did this through the whole thing, gradually building one or two lines onto it. Which of Milton's works was it? Paradise Lost. <laughs> Can you... Um can you uh, say those 50 lines today? No, I can't. Even the first one or two? No, not the first one or two. I don't think I could say any of them, really. I thought it was a useless assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out it was. <laughs> yes. R. Hildra. C. Rubin. The search for a memory drug is directed by psychologist John Burns. And G. Schwartzman. Small, controlled doses of various mind drugs are tried. An hour or more of waiting for the drugs to take effect. Some of the students have been given a fake pill, a placebo. Will there be any difference in the student's ability to learn and to retain what they've learned? Please raise your hand if you can hear clearly through your earphones. This study is concerned with memory for number sequences. In general, the sequence of numbers presented to you will exceed your memory capacity. Ready? One, three, two, seven, one, eight, four, one, two, seven, four, six, eight, three, two, eight, four, one, three, six. This is like trying to remember a long distance telephone number, or two or three all run together. Once or twice, a student has managed to get 20 digits right out of 20. 
The usual is five or six. Please stop and turn to the next page. On this device, the problem is to learn and remember which button turns off which light. Every beep means an error. Will the students who've been given mind drugs reach a solution faster than those who have not? In these various Michigan experiments, the data is still being compiled. So far, the researchers have not found a chemical that can be counted on to strengthen the brain's memory power. But they are closing in, certain they will find one in time. Eager specters who have cheerily prucked warriors through eight hard innings were set settlement. Only, only one was required to defeat the much feared champions. This student is also a participant in research. But there's more at stake than some data for the psychologists. This is Billy Simmons of Baltimore, age 10, a fourth grade pupil reading at second grade level. He's been referred to the Children's Psychiatric Service Lab at Johns Hopkins Hospital, where a research project in the chemistry of learning is sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health. A battery of tests, supervised by psychologist Keith Connors, confirms that Billy's IQ is comfortably above average. Why can't Billy read? The director of the project, Dr. Leon Eisenberg, child psychiatrist, probes for an answer with Billy's mother. Worse, usually his report cards start down bad and then uh, increases little by little till at the end of the year is better. Manages to squeeze by. Right. But this last year it just went downhill and all the way. That was in the fourth grade? It's in the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And so they now have him repeating the fourth grade. Yes. And what kind of complaints do they have about Billy? Uh, restlessness, uh, daydreaming, doesn't pay attention, uh, cannot finish his papers. Uh, his work is mostly always turned in incomplete. What was he like as an infant? Did he have any severe illnesses during his first couple of years? Uh, when he, he had a virus uh, when he was three months old, but then at 15 months old he had... The doctor's attention is directed to a childhood illness. It may have caused a slight chemical deficiency in the brain, making it difficult for Billy to concentrate, for the senses to screen out irrelevant impressions from important ones. It's a normal kind of defect, one that might occur in many otherwise healthy minds. The decision is to try a daily dosage of an amphetamine, a drug that in children seems to calm mental restlessness and lengthen the attention span. That's too big just for one family, said Mrs. Chase. We won't need so many pies. Six weeks after the start of treatment, we visited Billy in class at Lock Raven Elementary School. In these six weeks, his reading had improved by almost a whole grade level. All right, Ben, agreed his mother, but I can't imagine who will eat all the pies. Ben helped cut up the pumpkin with a sharp knife. Dr. Connors, you've been watching Billy's progress here with us. Is it just a change of attitude, or has the drug actually changed mental capacity? Very likely, there's a change in a number of areas in Billy. I think we can't rule out the possibility that there is an improved attitude. He's received attention, he's received a lot of interest, and I think he's begun to see that when he is calmed down a bit, he himself can learn, and he feels better about learning. So there's a reinforcement of his ability to learn by a change in attitude. On the other hand, I think there is more to it than that. I think Billy is calmer, less distractible, more ready to attend. He's receiving more of what's going on around him, and he's excluding more of those things that are irrelevant, that he shouldn't be paying attention to. And I think it's the focus uh, on his schoolwork that, is, uh, that has improved. Yet this is only the threshold. The new chemistry has produced drugs whose impact is far more dramatic than this. With them, the mind seems to take on some new dimension, more powerful perhaps, more creative, but at the same time, more vulnerable.
LSD, the inspiration and the subject of this experimental film, is the most drastic of the mind drugs. It disrupts the senses so that sounds may be seen, images felt or heard. This is part of the experience called psychedelic, mind expanding. In the language of the laboratory, LSD alters the chemistry of certain brain cells, alters them in a way that makes the brain hypersensitive to its environment, to shattering impressions or to helpful guidance. With bland, familiar music for a background, LSD, the vehicle of trips, of risky adventures, has also been used under careful medical control as a tool of psychotherapy, prying up memories, releasing buried feelings. <laughs> this single LSD session at a state hospital was the successful climax to a month-long treatment for alcoholism. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> there was, a, at one time, a laughter that broke through. And I think it was the best laugh I ever had in my life. It was just tremendous emotional release. And I really felt wonderful at that time. It was just terrific just to laugh. At the end, I felt the great weight had been taken off of me. Instead of feeling like it was the end of something, I felt like it was the beginning. Like it was something had opened up and things could be seen in a different light. With its startling effect on the emotions and the senses, LSD hints at the possibility of new ways of seeing things, new insights into the mysterious process we know as art. At some research centers, it has been used in serious experiments, again under professional supervision, to see if people can be made in some way more creative. This project, a municipal art center with museums, studios, and shops, was designed by an architect after taking LSD. He describes it as a kind of adventure of the imagination. You made these sketches during the session? Right? Yes, I did. How did it all happen? Essentially, during the, the quiet morning of not thinking about the project, but thinking in reference to it. Uh, I took a trip through architectural history and s visited and saw various cities and places. And at the end of the morning, prior to the work session, uh, we, we all sat up and had lunch and talked a little. And I sat down to start work on the project without one thought that came from before. The allure of LSD is overshadowed by its perils, the confusion of the senses, the loss of normal reality, even of your own identity. It suggests that the power to alter the processes of the mind could be used harm as well as for good, not just with LSD, but with mind drugs in general. Some of these awesome powers of chemistry can already be seen in the animal lab. This cat cannot stop or change directions, regardless of frustration, regardless of will. It has been deprived by chemistry of the power to carry out even the simplest of its own desires. Subject to laboratory control, the normal aggressiveness of cat toward mouse is changed to panicky fear by a mind drug in the form of a gas. In experiments like this, some researchers see the shape of vast powers to direct the lives of people, possibly of nations. One of the experimenters, Dr. James McConnell, University of Michigan psychologist. I think the time has come when we can take a man and change his behavior from whatever it is now and do whatever we want it to be. So it's physically possible, of course. We can't make him sprout wings and fly, but we can from a Christian into a communist or a communist into a Christian, either one. How will you do that, Dr. McConnell? In a variety of ways. We'll isolate him from his environment, give him drugs to make him dependent on the people who are working with him, and then uh, simply give him a positive form of brainwashing.
Few scientists see the future of the mind drugs in such stark terms in those images of 1984 of positive brainwashing and chemical control. From the outposts of research, science more often surveys its new powers in the light of humane tradition of medicine, health, education. The human mind is seen as marvel and mystery, a frontier to be explored and cultivated, not to be conquered. Among the pioneers of neurochemistry is Dr. Joel Elkis, director of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Are we about to reach a stage of knowledge? Control the minds of men. Influence states of mind, yes. Control, no, because control means always uniform. are unique. They respond in a very special way, one different from another. So that I think the uh, ominous vision of chemical control of men, of populations, is biologically unsound. There will always be differences. There will always be individual uh, individuals who do things in a way which is not the way in which the hypothetical controller would want. I judge from what you say that you're not at all disturbed, uh, worried, apprehensive about the revolution that is overtaking uh, the chemistry of the brain. No, because I think the uh, 9884 vision is at the moment, from all that we know, a fantasy, certainly if you regard as the chemist, the brain chemist, as Big Brother. There's no chance of that. And one of the tragedies, I think implicit in your question, sir, one of the tragedies of our age is an abdication of personal responsibility to the experts. And we've been through all these experts. Everyone has had a crack at, the, uh, at this expertise. Don't let's again run amok and say, now it's, it will be the chemist's uh, turn to control. Agreed, we know a fair amount, and I think we'll know more, and these drugs are therapeutically very useful. But still, please, uh, let us be clear that the important things which, the important cues which man responds to are the social cues, the environmental cues. Life to man is always other people. This is, in fact, what life is about, so, uh, man's life is about, is other people. And I envision something like this if we are beginning to think in terms of uh, improving human capacity chemically, which is certainly something which we ought to begin to think about seriously. It will go nowhere unless you really do something substantial about the early development, about the schools, about all the other social agencies which play upon the developing human being, and above all, unless you improve the personal involvement and social responsibility of particularly parents in regard to their children. Stand up and stretch way up tall. Everybody, let's stretch. To improve the mind chemically, that, as we've seen, is already possible. To improve concentration, memory, learning. To restore disordered thoughts and feelings by means of drugs. But this is the strongest kind of chemistry. Human chemistry, the influence of other people, parents, neighbors, teachers. may be healed or salvaged in the clinic or the laboratory. But here is where minds are formed in school and at home. Not by chemistry, but by wisdom, which is one of the vast remaining mysteries of the human mind that science may never be able to explain.